some writers, some people are like fractals. They do many different things and from a distance they look like a chaotic pattern. But when you look deeper, there's some kind of harmony. Peter Lamborn Wilson is a writer, he has written many books, has performed all over the world, reading. Some of his writing is very poetic, but one of the main themes is a place in time can be something else than just a place in time. It could be an autonomous zone, temporary autonomous zones. Peter, um, that's a concept you have written about uh, a long time ago now, 20 years, but what does that really mean? Uh, first of all, I wanted to say something about your fractal remark. I used to call this state uh, ambulatory schizophrenia. <laughs> I don't try to put all this stuff together. Uh, if I'm interested in... Uh, at one point I realized I was interested in both Sufism and anarchism, and it didn't seem to me that this was really something you could synthesize, but I decided to heck with it. I'd just be interested. I'm interested in it. So <clears throat> in that way, for me anyway, these things began to come together just because I decided to be schizophrenic about it. So anyway, if that's fractal, okay. Now, on your other point, <coughs> I still think that the uh, temporary autonomous zone is a relevant idea uh, because it happens. In other words, this is not something I invented. I always like to make, a, make that clear. I didn't, I'm not like the father of the TAZ. I just noticed it. Maybe I give a clever name or something that uh, has now escaped from my uh, grasp, and it's just, you know, it appears in, in the world now as a, a phrase. But um, that's because I think the reason why it's a good idea is because it's not my idea. It's something that happens. And this thing that happens is that no matter how, how much oppression there is from the state or how much monoculture there is from corporate global uh, capital, or no matter how much boredom, no matter how much uh, slavery, I mean, at any period in history, somehow magical community happens. I don't know how else to call it. It's not just the ordinary community, the one that you're born it's in. It's a community where the extra thing happens. Yeah. Now, uh, going to the deep roots of Christianity, some, I think Christ said, you know, when two or more are together in my name I'm there. Now this extra mm -hmm. thing that uh, one of the writers you, you, you talked about Fourier called like harmony mm -hmm. that um, exists in a group of people within a religious context which happens with uh, in what in Amsterdam we know the, the hacker groups, what happens in the in the crackers, uh, the, the, the squatter movement, what happened in Ruigort. Mm -hmm. Isn't that another name for Extra happiness, extra... Well, I, I was just trying to arrive at a, a social idea about that. Um, I was trying to see something in common with all those different kinds of uh, communities and uh, also seeing that this was a kind of a temporary thing because it depends on a special spirit, it depends on a very high state that everyone gets in together, uh, and that doesn't that's hard to sustain in human life. Um, you know, we don't have that many moments uh, of exaltation and, uh, you know... Yeah, but still, there seems to be some some logic to it. I, I mean, if yeah. people come together for a good dinner party and the atmosphere is good and the food is good and uh, maybe the music is good, that extra thing happens. Absolutely, but then, you know, then everybody goes home. Uh, the, the dinner party metaphor is, a, is an old one. It was used by the anarchists in the 19th century to say this was their idea of how a society could work all the time. Right, that you don't. Nobody makes rules for the dinner party. You sit there. You say, "Well, I mean, you know, maybe in a diplomatic dinner, but in a nice dinner party, you know, and no one tells you what you're going to talk about, and uh, you can each person could could bring some food, so no one's sure what the whole dinner would be like. You know, there's a lot of ways to introduce spontaneity within a situation where everybody's ready for it. A little wine, you know, exalted state. Uh, and you have your temporary autonomous zone for the evening. So you say autonomous. Could you also say isolated zone? Uh, well, isolation sometimes helps. Also, of course, historically, uh, like the pirate utopias, you know, you get far away from civilization, and it's perhaps easier for the spontaneity to occur. You can plan for spontaneity to emerge uh, when you have some isolation. Now it's a question whether such isolation could be possible. 
you know, I mean, certainly the pirate utopia idea is very hard to uh, sustain. Um, I'm just talking to these guys who are making the Y lands, you know, the the floating islands on um, on plastic rubbish, and I think that they, in the back of their minds, they have the idea of starting a a new country or something, based on these uh, on these rafts. And I was saying, I don't think that's a good idea because um, the the combination of corporate power and the nation state, you know, they're going to blow you out of the water. They have all the big guns. They have satellites that can see exactly where you are all the time. Blah blah blah, mm. you know. So that kind of idea of political independence is very dicey, very questionable now. Yeah, but are there places in like? Other, in other words, you can't be isolated by your own fiat. You know, I am now isolated. I'm a nation state. Mm. Someone's going to blow you out of the water. So you either have to hide, or you have to find a niche somewhere. Now, is cyberspace such a a place where? Ten years ago, people thought this would be the new utopia, the the new democracy, the new place where. Uh, new ideas and, and, and even revolutionary ideas could flourish. Well, I, I have to say, not even 20 years ago did I say that. I never said that. People accuse me of saying that, but they, they, don't have, they haven't read the book. What I said was that the temporary autonomous zone is a place, a physical place in time. And cyberspace is not a physical place. Be, uh, you have inter interactivity, but you have no communication, uh, no community, because the body isn't there, the nose isn't there, the, the ears are usually not there. Usually, only the eyes are there, and uh, the uh, you know eyesight is this supposedly the noble sight because it's detached from our bodies and it's the source of our knowledge of the world and so forth and so on. But the isolation of the sense of the one sense. Um, I think is uh, potentially sickening, you know, on the social, especially on the social level. And um, I also think that uh, what, I, what I said 20 years ago was that this cyber thing, which uh, I don't even know if we used the word then, uh, could be uh, uh, an, uh, a, a way to potentiate the possibility of the emergence of the TAZ through um, uh, communications, right? I'm not sure that even this has been realized. But, so the idea was there that you could use communication, uh, email and so on, to bring people together on a specific sur a subject and in a specific mood that could lead to this, this um, yeah. I, f I find it, when I hear you talking about the temporary autonomous zones, what comes to mind is one plus one is three. You see, uh, two people, and then there's something extra, and that extra is what you have tried to to find, to describe, in in, in ranging from dinner parties to pirates in, on the high seas. Yeah, sure. Uh, I like to quote uh, Michel Serret, uh, Serret, Serret, the French philosopher who t talks about Hermes, and he says that uh, whenever whenever there are two, then Hermes arrives. It's the, he's the, th the third. Uh, he's, 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 he is communication, he is the secret, he is uh, the guest, the parasite, the third, uh, this, this mysterious force, you know, and um, that's the uh, magic, if you like, uh, of, uh, of the TAZ, is this uh, third, the third, un the uninvited guest. Okay, at the same time, these TAZs that you've described, apart maybe from uh, harmless dinner parties, uh, have been groups or situations w that were seen by society as uh, threatening. Take the pirate uh, uh, empires in, the, in North Africa or in, in the high seas in the, in the Caribbean. Uh, take uh, the, uh, the communities that you describe in the 19th century. Uh, one of them was called the Phalanx by uh, Fourier. Sure. Well, those were intentional communities in modern yeah. terms. They were always seen as dangerous to the present order, the political order. Sure. If you're autonomous long enough, you get noticed, and then the, the trouble starts. You know. Uh, and usually, I find uh, for these uh, political or, or violent TAZs, the ones that achieve a large scale, the size of a city or even a, perhaps a, a region. These these tend to last about eighteen months to two years. I don't, I don't you know. Uh, all I can say is that seems to be an organic time, time length for these events. Uh, uh, Rauchort is already twenty eight years old. That's very unusual. 
Um, most of the communes die before two years, historically. A few, you know, some survive longer. But, but talking about Ruigort, I sometimes have the feeling that the fact that they were oppressed and threatened and that the, the, the government wanted to build there, uh, in fact, made the community stronger and that many communities thrive by an us and them feeling, that their, that their harmony is, in fact... Um, derived from the fact that they have a common enemy. I suppose that could often be the case, but I don't think it's a sufficient case. I mean, it's not sufficient to make the case. Um, that, that's very true of religious communes, for example, you know, the us and them uh, mentality. And those, are, those do tend to be the ones that last the longest, historically. You got a very tight authoritarian religion with a charismatic leader, usually, and an us and them uh, situ uh, mentality. You're very close to having what, what they call a cult nowadays. And in the 19th century, those people could get isolated, and a lot of them lasted a long time. There's a few uh, German Anabaptist communities in America that are still going, you know, even on their original utopian uh, um, Protestant mystical uh, basis. So, but that, you know, it's not what I call a TAZ, because now an authority figure is there, uh, an ideology is there, uh, um, a kind of repli replication of order. These things don't go with the, with the TAZ. So at a certain point, uh, those religious communes, I don't, I don't discuss them because they don't fit in my uh, category. Is that the point where they go from experiential, from being together and feeling that to some kind of dogmatic uh, <laughs> situation where the rules are... are hierarchically imposed. I suppose so. I mean, in the beginning, these, these uh, kind of communities are usually the charisma of the leader and the, the bliss, you know, or ecstasy or whatever that the people are experiencing. This uh, makes it all voluntary. There's no coercion involved, you know what I mean? So, but then at a certain point, like let's say the leader dies and the next leader comes or is replaced by a committee of the elders. These are common scenarios. But, uh, I, by the way, I don't want to say that uh, I, I don't believe in utopia, I don't believe in the permanent autonomous zone. Yeah, why not? You know, I still say this is a, uh, an interesting possibility. And uh, I would also say that many temporary autonomous zones are put together by people who believe they're going to be permanent, and that's part of the energy that they needed to do it in the first place, right? So I certainly, from many points of view, uh, philo philosophical, uh, psychological, and science fictional, I don't want to uh, um, do away with the idea of permanence. All I'm saying is that the temporary autonomous zone happens because human beings have a bodily and emotional and spiritual and intellectual need to come together sometime in their life uh, to potentiate each other and make this little community or, or big slightly bigger community happen in such a way as to get these extraordinary experiences, these deep emotions, the memories that will last forever. You know, it's like a love affair, but it happens with maybe anywhere from, from three to 30,000 people, yeah. you know? So, uh, this but we all have those memories that, that, oh, one, so. that one, either a, a funeral or a marriage, you know, springtime marriage where the whole family and all the friends were together, and there was this atmosphere that never came back, and we were all one for a short time. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, everybody, I hope everybody has such at least one such experience. All I was trying to do was uh, theorize and generalize about those experiences. Thank you. Now, right? for a person that has studied the plus in the one plus one is three thing, uh, you, you, you come across in our conversation a little bit as disillusioned with the present political system, with the world. Um, you're looking for this this bliss situation, and you write about it, but you don't see it in the world these days anymore. Well, uh, like I say, the TAZ happens, and it's gonna. I think it would happen no matter what, even if there was like the whole world was a parking lot with you know McDonald's every 400 feet, uh, so somewhere in some little corner. Be it must be in the master plan. Yeah, yeah be <laughs> behind some you know garbage bin in the universal shopping center. Some kids will get together and, uh, you know, discover something different. And for a few hours or a few days or a few months or even a couple of years, you know, and then that will be great for them. So that's going to happen because it's going to happen. But, you know, uh, the question for me now is, can this be something more than uh, a spontaneous occurrence? Can it be more even than a tactic? Can it be part of a strategy 
that we could imagine and theorize um, that would be a global response to global, uh, glo the global image uh, of global capital. Uh, what we're looking for is a global resistance that's uh, also based on the particular, on difference, on locality, on, on p being in place. Mm -hmm. So that's a paradox because I don't think a movement like that has existed before in, in history. Doesn't it at times? I mean, uh, maybe it's a, a bad uh, example or a very good example is the dot-com market where young kids came together, started new companies, and for the past two or three, four years, they made a lot of money and they had this feeling of, man, this is it, you know? Now the bubble is uh, <laughs> collapsed. Um, You're not going to get me to say that was a temporary autonomous zone. <laughs> <laughs> that I mean, that was just like a, a, a parasitical growth on global capital, in my view. Or yeah, but the, the people that were involved now say these were the hey days of our of our of our life. These were the was the period that we yeah, all. I mean, lawyers, I suppose. I mean, everybody has you know, right? I don't care though. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just don't care. Yeah. But what we're looking for is what is the next temporary autonomous zone or the next movement in the world where it is plus feeling comes up again. Well, you know, every kind of social intoxication is not what I'm talking about. There's a social intoxication of tulipomania, okay? Uh, this, is not, uh, uh, this, is, this is not my utopia, right? I mean, I, uh, uh, yeah, sure, maybe so a psychologist will tell you there's a link between these two experiences, but I want to politicize one of them, or actually I want to politicize both of them, I'm st I want to have a value. I want to make a value judgment between them, and uh, I do. You know, so sue me. You know, but from temporary autonomous autonomous zone to Sufism, uh, let's let's briefly try to explain what Sufism is. Okay. Well, briefly, it's the esoteric movement within Islam, historically speaking, uh, usually organized into orders, although not always. Uh, usually with a transmission from master to disciple, although not, not always. There are always exceptions to everything, especially in Sufism. Could you call it the, the mystical side of, of Islam? Yeah, as a general yeah, sort of definition. Okay. Now, these are groups of people that uh, have a common belief system and a common goal, which, which could be described as, as um, coming close to God. Now, how does that relate to temporary autonomous zones? Well, like I said, uh, for me, uh, since I'm a, w a willing schizophrenic, I don't necessarily have to relate these things, but I will, I'll try. Um, in a sense, uh, it's certain social aspects of Sufism that perhaps interested me in this, in this particular context. Uh, in other words, whether belief in God or whatever, that's uh, not a relevant factor here because some TAZs believe in God and some are atheistic and, you know, it doesn't seem to make a difference there. Atheists can have, uh, you know, alpha experiences or whatever you want to call it also. So, uh, but what interested me in the history of Sufism is certain social things that I noticed about um, tightly knit brotherhoods or uh, siblinghoods or whatever you want to call them. Sometimes women are involved. Uh, uh, that once again you get a group um, turning itself on, Yeah. And they call it, there's even a name for this, spiritual companionship, so that uh, it's considered to be very difficult to do this alone. You, know, you, have, to have, uh, you have to have some special relationship with uh, this theological principle, really, uh, to hope to be able to do it alone. So the group becomes very important, and the group dynamic becomes very important. And then you have some Sufi orders or heretical groups, which interests me a great deal, where even the figure of the master is not present. You know, the, the master comes in dreams, let's say. So there's no single human m guru. Now that gets really interesting because these groups seem to be um, uh, self-organized, uh, spontaneously self-formed groups to a certain extent. Then, of course, since it's the Orient, these groups get their own traditions and they try to perpetuate themselves and sometimes they turn into their opposite in some way. But there's always that fascinating moment at some point in their development where uh, on, the, on the social level, some kind of fabulous freedom occurs, right? So you have groups that, within very rigid traditional societies, find this magical door out of the oppression. Yeah. But then oppression happens because the surrounding world, the, the 
ecclesiastic system by the church of the uh, the, the the Islam then says we we don't allow you to think for yourself and experience this freedom. Okay, well, it's an important point here. The, uh, Islam denies that it is a church in the Christian sense of the word. It doesn't have a pope, and in fact, it doesn't really have uh, an absolute absolute dogma. The prophet said, anyone who greets you with salam alaikum, peace, anyone who greets you with peace, you must assume that they're a Muslim. You don't ask the question until they do something which is offends against Islam. Uh, so what you privately believe is very important in Islam. And in fact, you can practice Islam in isolation. You are your own priest, right? All these mullahs, they do not have sacramental roles to play. They're simply intellectuals or learned people, ideally, who know more about the religion than you do. So you go to them for advice. Uh, so there's this sort so of... there's less of a ceremonial role. Well, there's this, this so-called democracy, democratic aspect within Islam. Uh, ceremony, actually, I suppose, yeah, sure, compared with, you know, the ancient Chinese religion, there's much less ceremony in Islam also, although it's a religion, you've got to have ritual. Uh, and it can be very ritualized, it can get very ritual heavy. But that's what Sufism wants to break through, always, you know, there's always, uh, they say there's no formality in Sufism. There's no, no good manners in Sufism, or either that or Sufism is good manners, you know, so you make an identity between the two. There's no, there's no hypocrisy about manners. There's no, uh, there should be, everything should be clear and open. Uh, and at the same time, you're talking about a secret. But why is, it, why is it a secret? Only because other people haven't understood it. It's an open secret in that sense. Through history, the Sufis have been... Uh accused of heresy, have been uh, persecuted. Okay, so right. Um, in fact, uh, there is no pope to say that these people are heretics. Um, there is a consensus of the community, maybe. Uh, and generally speaking, historically, the consensus of the community has been that Sufism has at least a place within Islam. It's not considered to be heretical per se except by modern extremists or Puritans or, you know, rigid, uh, hyper-Orthodox types. But they don't have any ultimate authority. If you want to go off and call yourself a Muslim and do Sufism, hey, you know, that's your business. Now, yes, Sufism has been persecuted. Uh, Sufism is probably more persecuted now than it ever was, actually, because these Wahhabis, these fundamentalists, hate it. They really hate it. And they have. Why do they hate it? Uh, it rivals them for power. You know, in other words, the, the fundamentalists are very authoritarian. They say our guys are the guys. You know, who understand, who are who are right, who are correct. All these other Im interpretations of Sufism are wrong. I mean, of Islam are wrong. Uh, we're the only right, true Muslims. Well, obviously, Sufis can't believe this. They have to be tolerant on some level. I mean, that's just part of being a mystic in a way. So there's a conflict there, and uh, since... But this is the same conflict that happened in the church, in the Catholic church with some mystics. They were always said they, that since they followed their own internal guide rather than, than the Pope or the, or the system, they were sometimes, uh, well, put on the stakes. Right, but there's plenty of mystics also that remained inside the church who managed to reconcile themselves to dogma and were not burned at the stake, and they're accepted. You know, I mean, uh, St. Saint, Saint Catherine or uh, John of the Cross, they're still inside the church, you know. Uh, sometimes barely so. Sometimes barely so, and sometimes there's, you know, there's slippage on both sides. Um, you're thinking more of, you know, uh, Giordano Bruno or somebody like that who's an out-and-out -out heretic. Right, who rejected the, the well, church. Uh, Meister Eckhart, of course, was also uh, uh, on the borderline. On the borderline, right. His teachings are now, as far as I know, actually accepted within Catholic dogma. Yeah. yeah. Although they very much go to the same as what, what I see in Sufism, is that you yourself, there's some inner uh, principle in you that goes above whatever the church or the world or the dogma says. Uh, there's two ways of looking at this. Most Sufis would answer you that Sufism is an intensification of that inner essence of Islam, that what they're doing is at the center of Islam, not the periphery. That's our view, not their view, by and large. So you have to give credit to their view. You have to understand their view. Their view is that you can't really be a Muslim without being a Sufi. 
Um, now, you know, then when we're looking at the situation from outside, maybe we don't see it that way because historically Sufism has never been the power. It's never had the power. Uh, but even if you begin, if you examine that idea, even that begins to fall apart because I'll tell you why. Uh, the mullahs, you know, the religious authorities have often been against, let's say, the king. I mean, we saw that in Iran even in, in the last century. So uh, the king then adopts Sufism or, you know, pretends to adopt Sufism in order to have a spiritual support for his own power system against the mullahs, against the clergy, so-called clergy. Uh, uh, so uh, at certain points, like I'm just, I've just been reading a Mughal dynasty history of India, all these emperors were Sufis. I don't know how sincere they were, but uh, the last emperor was uh, considered a Sufi master, and he initiated uh, his, own, his own disciples mm -hmm. in the Chishti order. Why did you at any time become a Sufi yourself? Well, all right. Um, Sufis don't call themselves Sufis, <laughs> because Sufi actually means someone who's realized. And if you say you're realized, well, I have to distrust you. Um, so, but yeah, I was, I've been involved in Sufi orders. In, what was the attraction? Uh, to discover, uh, you know, to get to the bottom of it. But you could have become a, a Mason, a Freemason, or join, uh, I don't know, whatever secret esoteric order. Yeah, uh, that's true. Um, there's an emotional attraction, you know. I mean, if I believed in reincarnation, I guess I would have an easy answer to your question. Why? Because then Sufism is a more... No, no, I mean, I f maybe I could say, oh, in another life I was uh, oh. yeah, blah, blah. But uh, I'm not going to say that either. It's just some kind of um, personal attraction. Did you experience this feeling of brotherhood that then makes the link to the temporary autonomous zo zone? Did you experience that with, within your Sufi times? Um, yes and no. <laughs> yes, as it happens sometime, and no, as uh, there were always some uh, idiots there. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, maybe that. I guess, uh, um, well, there's a story about, uh, have we got a few minutes? Yeah. There's a story about a famous philosopher named Averroes and a famous Sufi named Ibn Arabi who uh, supposedly met at one time. They were passing on donkeys and they recognized each other in the desert or something. And uh, Averroes uh, sa sta says, what do you think? Meaning, what do you think of my philosophy? And uh, Ibn Arabi says, yes. And Averroes is very happy. And, he says, and then Ibn Arabi says, no. Averroes is very sad. And then Ibn Arabi says, between yes and no, stars fall from heaven and heads fly off from their necks. So that's what I meant. Try to explain that. <laughs> oh, God damn. <laughs> I thought I'd get away with that. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, I experienced this uh, brotherhood feeling, and I also noticed it in observing other you know, groups that I would be with. Uh, but ultimately, I found it, this, um, for myself, you know, not fully satisfying. Mm -hmm. Because uh, it's still... How can I put it? You know, I don't want to. I don't want to appear as a critic of Sufism. I just want to say maybe that um, I needed something uh, different. Or, uh, uh, but but their rituals, their their ceremonies, in as far as there are ceremonies. But I think it's called digger or seeker. Yeah. Um, did would you say that is a, a bona fide way to experience the inner guide? Uh, often, I think so. I mean, uh, let me put it this way. In in the East, there's so many reasons to join a Sufi order, and they're not all about the zikr or the mystical brotherhood. Uh, sometimes it's a very practical thing. If you don't have any great family connections, you're not very rich, uh, um, you're not a very powerful person, uh, you don't have any connections in the court, uh, uh, um, you need some kind of a sodality, some kind of a thing to belong to. Your family isn't enough. So the Sufi order is there to serve a function you know, rather like Freemasonry, uh, 
has done historically, to be a, a mutual help, mutual aid society. So, for example, um, like the Freemasons used to, ch- everyone would chip in a penny at every meeting, and uh, if a member died uh, poor, they would that would buy the coffin. So it was a kind of death insurance. And then later that idea began to grow and became life insurance as well. So Sufism also serves a function a little bit like that. I remember once uh, going to uh, a bank in Tehran with a check from a Sufi master, and, and he sent one of his disciples with me. And it had to do with some business with my, the publishing group I was working with. And uh, we arrived at the bank, and it was like total chaos. It was zillions of people. Nobody was standing in line. Everyone was shouting and screaming and waving papers. And I thought, oh, God, I'm going to be here all day. Suddenly, this guy runs over and says, Ya Ali. And the disciple who's with me says, Ya Ali. And it's a disciple. Another disciple is in the bank. He says, what do you, what do you want? It's the, the master's business. This is the master's check. <gasps> Come with me. Whoop, right into the back office. President of the bank. Ya Ali. Stands up. Ya Ali. It's the master's check. <laughs> you know, cashes it in two <laughs> seconds. We're out of the bank. And then I realize, wow, it's really useful to belong to a Sufi order. You know, you don't have to stand in the bank all day. Yeah? You've got brothers everywhere. Okay. But so that's similar to being a Freemason in the States. And now you have belong, or you belong to another brotherhood, a, a family of, um, of poets. Let's call this, the, in general, the psychedelic uh, movement, yeah? Um, if you compare that to the Sufis. Mm, well, yeah, there's so many ways. Well, to start with... Well, Most of the people who have taken psychedelics have some kind of understanding of the unitive experience of this spiritual connection. Right. I actually think that in that in, in the case of the psychedelic uh, movement, that a little more ritual is required. Yeah. So that's my critique of of, the, of them. Uh, if I've made a critique of Sufism, and I apologize if uh, if it. Uh, seems offensive, I would also then have to make a critique of the Western experience, which is too diffuse and flows out like water in the, in the desert and sinks into the sand. If we had a little, just a little more tightness, you know, a little more, uh, or, uh, a little more organization, crystal form to it. Uh, and I think that there's a ritual movement emerging spontaneously now in the third psychedelic generation which I find very interesting and I'm sympathetic. Are you referring to people who, who pick up from, say, the ayahuasca traditions, the uh, Santo Daime traditions from the Brazilians? Uh, I wasn't thinking of Santo Daime specifically because I, I have never experienced that, but it sounds like a church. Uh, I'm not sure that that's what every Westerner wants, is to go back into a church. Um, but also the ayahuasca movement is much more, much, much broader than that, and we have shamans coming up from South America and doing it right, you know, showing people how to do it right. Minimum ritual, you know, they're not asking you to convert to uh, their religion, their tribal religion. They're just making sure that you, you know what to eat and you're not going to, you know, that you, you're going to see spirits and how to talk to the spirits. It's a little basic instruction. But this gives so much shape to the psychedelic experience, to have a shaman there doing it with you, you know, maybe brushing you with a feather when you're feeling bad, or whatever it, whatever it is. This is very good. This is very helpful. As long as it doesn't, so you would say it that doesn't become a new dogma, you know. But the, the Greeks seemingly had a tradition of the Elysian uh, mysteries that some scholars say was either based on mushrooms or uh, some LSD type of uh, ergot. Um, and that they kept going for 800 years in a ritualistic way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and apparently fairly autonomous. Uh, I mean, the cult itself was aut- fairly autonomous. Uh, well, of course, in paganism, everything is fairly autonomous. Well, there seem to have been two families who kind of controlled it for yeah. a long, long time. Yeah, yeah. Um, in my view, this is a branch of the great Indo-European Soma tradition, which you have, of course, most uh, clearly in India, with the, in the Rig Veda, and in, and in Iran, uh, the, where it's called home. I think you have to explain what Soma is. Soma is a magical, mystical uh, substance that we could relate to as, as a psychedelic drink. Right. In the ancient texts, I mean, for many years it wasn't clear to modern scholars what they were talking about. Uh, it was all kinds of crazy ideas. But then uh, Gordon Wasson said, oh, it's mushrooms. And since then we've been unable to think. I mean, you can't discuss this question without taking psychedelics into consideration, even if you're going to disagree with it. My own view is that Soma could have been many things, many, dip- many times in many places. I don't make any one single identification. 
uh, but it's a principle. It's more like there's a principle involved, and that principle is a physical substance which transforms you through vision. So that could even be wine or or or, or um, meditation. You or know. tobacco, as the North American Indian. Absolutely, tobacco is the most widespread shamanistic drug in the world. Uh, it just so happens that it's been completely domesticated by us, and we've lost touch with whatever mystical functions it ever had. You know, well, not completely lost touch, but largely lost touch with those shamanic possibilities. Same with you know coffee and tea and. Uh, alcohol in our culture. Do you feel that uh, we're in Amsterdam here that the use of uh, of uh, hashish or marijuana or wheat um, has gone the same way that from originally being a, a way into another experience has now become like a, a daily domesticated uh, drug? Yeah, I see aspects of that and I'm actually, <clears throat> I like to say that I'm against legalization. I mean, it's very nice to be here in Amsterdam where everything is loose and groovy. You know, and it's a nice contrast with America where everything is paranoid and stupid. But um, on the other hand, I see that by repressive tolerance, you can actually uh, render the experience I'm talking about fairly meaningless. Uh, by commercializing something, by domesticating something, you can actually take the initiatic, uh, magical, uh, dangerous, risky... Uh, spooky. Uh, so, so by taking away the magical, the, the holy dimension, and making it a a, a daily uh, thing to 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 smoke, to have a joint, uh, you say you take away the potential for a spiritual deepening. We lack uh, what uh, the anthropologists call rite of passage in our Western society. I mean, you know, a lot of modern New Age type uh, philosophers are commenting on this. It's, it simply happens to be true. We don't have a formalized initiation in our society. So people, because initiation is a great human desire, people look, people look to create their own uh, or to participate in something that they uh, perceive as initi an in initiatic experience. And of course that always involves risk. You know, the Sufis say you actually pay for that with your head. You know, it's a very risky situation. And so uh, young people especially, you know, they're looking for a risky situation. And when they, when they do this with psychedelics, there's a chance of a terrific payoff. You know, you could see God. As, the, as we used to say in the 60s. Uh, and you run that risk. It's illegal. And that's one, and one of the major reasons why it's risky. It's illegal. Yeah? It's forbidden. Uh, it's a forbidden mystery. Uh, all you have to do to destroy that is legalize the drugs. You know? And pretty soon that, f that form of initiation will no longer be, it won't have the same appeal. It won't serve the same function. Okay, but whose responsibility is it then to, to keep up some kind of rites of passage or initiation in a society? Is it the government that should uh, still keep uh, like the draft going and say, hey, I mean, for me, there was a period where I, uh, I joined the army for not too long, but anyway, there was a period where I became from a boy a man. There was definitely a feeling, group feeling, a um, little bit of rough times, you know, all the exercise shit. Um, no, it was... You know, uh, I think an a any anthropologist would say there was a strong rite of passage aspect to your experience and that in Europe, within the European peacetime armies, uh, I think Switzerland is a good example too, that yeah, this, this, could, this could be very much an unconscious purpose still in, in the social acceptance of these uh, institutions. But, um, <clears throat> you know, I don't, I don't particularly want to uh, then uh, say that the uh, military uh, draft is a good idea. I don't think it's anybody's responsibility to keep these uh, initiatic experiences open. Uh, it's our, or it's our, you know, it's everybody's responsibility. Would it have been the churches? Any churches? It used to be. Well, how could it be now? You know, there's no universal church. I mean, at the time when it's assumed that everybody is a Catholic, then the Catholic Church has all those possibilities within it. In a time when you could be anything or nothing, no, no one of these churches is going to be serving that function for society as a whole, obviously. So this is why something unorganized, something unexpected, something you know from another dimension almost, I, that is psychedelic drugs, psychedelic experience, it comes along and starts to admirably, or in many ways admirably, fulfill this function. And uh, uh, if, if we're going to have legal drugs, then I want, the whole, I want the whole revolution at the same time. I don't want to see legal drugs in the present situation 
because the only then the next and only really last form of initiation is going to be violence, and you're seeing that in the American. See that too, too, I mean, take uh, alcohol when you're uh, 18 and you can have your first drink. Uh, take computers. I remember my kids having their first go at uh, computer games, and um, since my son became a computer game designer, I would say it was a, a heavy initiation for him. I guess, yeah. yeah? I, I suppose so, yeah. Uh, you're saying that, that anything you like is an initiation, though? No, anything that changes your perspective in a dramatic way. I suppose that must be so. Yeah. So, <coughs> what could be more... Uh, w w Didn't we experience Internet, the coming <laughs> at age of Internet, say, in 93, 94, when it happened, as some kind of initiation into cyberspace? I don't know. I didn't. Uh, it never happened for me. If you tell me it happened for you, I'll, I'll accept that. However, I would also then say the same thing, uh, or similar thing that I said about cyberspace as, t as a TAZ, which I, I reject. Uh, I would also say that initiation is to put you in touch with the spiritual realm, and I'm not going to define that. I'm going to leave that as an empirical experience, that you know what I'm talking about, and they know what I'm talking about, and I know what I'm talking about, but if we try to talk about it, will we'll ruin our understanding. So let's just say initiation is about getting in touch with the realm of the spirits. And that is not cyberspace. I know that William Gibson predicted that cyberspace would be haunted by gods. Well, the religion of uh, progress these days with this, uh, what I call the telecommissars, the people that are in the telecommunication world and seeing themselves as the new priests, uh, there is a feeling of a religion and of, of, of a... Bet. There's uh, a religion, you know, bad religion and the internet were made for each other. Cyberspace is a perfect place for these uh, priests, you know, they love it, they're all on the net. Um, religion is thriving on the internet, new age religion, old religion, you name it. Uh, but that's from my point of view because they're, they're, they're lame, they're lost, they're out of touch. They think that they're in touch with something spiritual just because they can't feel their bodies. Their bodies are numb, so they think it's spirit. Uh, you know, it's not, it, again, I don't, I don't have this feeling. I don't open up on this level. Maybe uh, I, I sense a deeper Sufi feeling that whatever you do in the other realm has to be related to this realm, to the body, to the, to the senses. Absolutely. I mean, it's not a disembodied religion. It's a yeah, I don't know if that's Sufism or not. I mean, you find all sorts of different ideas in Sufism. This is my idea. I don't think there's any spiritual realm without the body realm, and I think that uh, it's, in fact, impossible to make any kind of meaning, meaningful separation between them. So anything that starts towards a process of disembodiment, for me, is anti-spiritual. But, hey, you know, that's, again, that's my perspective. Um, there are some people who uh, can only feel spiritual if they're escaping from their body in so, or think that they're escaping from their body or that they're going to escape from their body in some future state. And in fact, I would say that's, you know, that's far more common in religion than what I'm saying. Yeah. But, but, but so what you're saying is that that might be what in psychology sometimes is called a counterphobic. An, an attitude of say, well, I'm going to jump out of planes or these days you do bungee jumping and... and kind of go against the fear of the body, deliberately trying to get a, a peak experience out of it. Uh, we have uh, theme parks, I mean, I think the whole Disneyland rides are based on the fact that there's some, oh, some rush coming up, and that you think that you getting close to that other realm by just stepping out of your body. There's one, always one problem for me, and that is when capital is mediating this experience, I distrust it. At the, my, at the deepest possible level. So as soon as I see that this is a product I'm being offered uh, or that there's some product I have to buy in order to do it, who was it said, always distrust any situation that requires you to buy new clothes? You know? Uh, usually it means you're getting a job or you're getting married or something you should be very, very careful about, you know? And so uh, anytime I hear that there's a product involved, uh, you know, tick, 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 my mind begins to work and I'm saying, watch out. You know, this is capital tricking you again, uh, trying to create false desires in order to, you know, sell you stuff. And that stuff, of course, is everything. Capital, uh, the, the world of capital is so desperate now that the attempt is to sell you auth your authentic life. I'm going to sell you your own authentic life. You buy this car, I promise you a peak experience. You know, an authentic, ecstatic experience. 
You buy the soft drink, you know, it's like better than being high. You can see by the, you know, insane smiles on the faces of the models. Nothing makes you happy, that happy, except maybe drugs, you know. That's why drugs are so popular. But isn't that where religion and capitalism come together, that it sells you experiences? Preferably peak experience, preferably the best experience. As soon as that happens, Martin Luther comes and nails the shit to the wall, you know. Uh, some, then someone is going to come and say, uh, that's, not, that's not my religion. Uh, that always happens, you know. Every time a religion gets top-heavy with money and organization and so forth, bam, you know, the people from underneath start uh, get, getting out and starting a new show. And sometimes that gets exceedingly violent, like in 1640 in England, you know, or, or uh, 1525 in uh, Germany. When the Reformation happened. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm th I was thinking of the peasant, re peasant revolt, uh, the Anabaptist uprisings. That, Lu that Luther then crushed, you know. Would you say that we're close to a similar kind of uprising against this um, um, capitalist system, which now sometimes is called here the kleptocratic system, where people, you know, they're only for their own pockets? I, you know, th I've also heard biopirates, you know, the people who are doing gene genetic uh, manipulation. I don't like this term. These are not pirates. Pirates were against the system. These people are the system. Let's not dignify them by calling them pirates or thieves. It's far worse than that. Now, what was the question again? Do I think that there's an uprising coming? God, I wish I could say yes, you know. Uh, I, I told the people in Rotterdam last night, I live in hope. You know, I haven't given up being hopeful. Uh, I can't be optimistic, but I still cling to my anti-pessimism. You know, I would like to see the dialectic get started again. You know, I'd like to think this is not the end of history. Okay, let's get some movement in uh, society and in the universe. Okay, Peter, uh, a last word. Um, revolutionary hope. Thank you.